Okay, so now I'll read the scripture reading. <laughs> it comes from Luke 5, verses 1 through 11. Once, while Jesus was standing by the lake of Genesaret, and the crowds were pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there at the, sh at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of the boats and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put a little way out from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, master, we have worked all night long, but we have caught nothing. Yet if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boats to come and help them. And they came and filled both boats so they were beginning to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees saying, Go away from me, Lord, I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were so amazed at the catch of fish they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, oh, do not be afraid. From now on, you will be catching people. When they had brought the boats to shore, they left everything and followed him. Thus be the word of God. It's great to be back at the beach. <laughs> A lot of water has gone under the pier, right? <laughs> Since a lot of us have seen each other uh, here in this church. Certainly since I've seen you inside the sanctuary. I've been with the adult group a number of times on Zoom, but it's just great to be back in the sanctuary worshiping with you all. We're drawn to the beach. I certainly am. You certainly are. You wouldn't be here, right? <laughs> you love the beach, right? There's something about the sea that draws us toward it. Is that not true? Lots of levels and reasons. Let me share a poem with you about this subject, one that I love so much, from that most lower case of poets, E.E. E. Cummings. Yes? Maggie and Millie and Molly and May went down to the beach to play one day, and Maggie discovered a shell that sang so sweetly she couldn't remember her troubles and Molly was chased by a horrible thing which raced sideways while blowing bubbles and May came home with a smooth round stone as small as a world and as large as alone. For whatever we lose, like a you or a me, it's always ourselves we find at the sea. Yes? It's always ourselves that we find at the sea. Think of it. That might have been what drew, what drew you to be here. To be here in Manhattan Beach and to be here in the church. And I would suggest that the church is a, squim, a swim school. It's where we learn how to swim in the sea. I had a chat with uh, our neighbor in Ojai yesterday. She was taking a walk, and she told us that uh, she has a big pool in her yard. And um, she said that back in the day, she's an older woman, and back in the day she used to teach swimming there. She had a, the, the Hartman Swim School of Ojai. And she said our motto of our swim school was, walk in, swim out. Walk in, swim out. Now, of course, if it was Jesus' school, it would have been walk in, walk on. <laughs> right? You know, some people ask, you know, why did, why did Jesus walk on water? Because he didn't know how to swim. <laughs> and actually, there's, that's probably true. You know, hardly anybody in ancient times knew how to swim, including fishermen and fisherwomen. They didn't know how to swim. 
That's why they were so petrified when they were on the boat with Jesus when the storm kicked up and the waves were crashing. They were completely freaked out because if they fell out of the boat, it was all over for them, right? So Jesus taught them a different type of mastery of the water, yes, walking on the water. What a profound, sacred myth that story is. All these stories, profound and sacred myths. Like the one at the end of the gospel in John, let us prepare our souls to receive more of the sacred myth of Scripture. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he showed himself this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas the twin, Nathaniel of Cana, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. Side note here. Uh, we got the first story. Jesus says, I'm going to turn you folks into fishers of people, right? Well, after he died, his fisher folk friends, his disciples, went back to fishing for fish, right? I am going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. Got to do something, got to make a living, got to feed themselves, got to feed their people, got to take, get back to business. So they went out, got on the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was him. Jesus said to them, children, you have no fish, do you? And they answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net to the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. The disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes. Now that's backwards. <laughs> he put on some clothes and jumped into the sea. What's wrong with this picture? Yes. But the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far off from land, only about 100 yards off. When they had gone ashore, they, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it. Wait a minute, how'd those fish get there? And bread. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you've just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, 153 of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. 153 fish. Why does the sacred myth tell us that there's 153 fish? Because the story is, the message might be, that every one of those fish was numbered and counted, right? Because the Christ is the knowledge within us of the depths of ourselves. Yes, the Christ is the consciousness that we have when we're able to name the fish swimming around in our inner spiritual sea. Name the number, number them, mark them, notice them. And that's what we do in spiritual practice, is it not? To pay attention to what is swimming around in the chaotic mess of our souls. How many of you have had a dream in which water played a large part? Yo. Oh, most of us, yes. No accident, is it? We came out of water, the water of the womb. We, were, we started out our journey into human life in the water, right? And then we came out of that water into this world, but the water is still within us. What are we, 98% water? And we're swimming in an unconscious realm all the time, whether we know it or not. Are we aware of what's in that water? Are we watching? Do we have consciousness of it? Do we see what's in there? The Christ is the figure that symbolizes and represents and, and constellates this consciousness that is available to us of what's going on inside of us. 
And that's what we do in spiritual practice, contemplative practice, meditative practice, is to look and see what's in there. And the Christ represents mastery over that realm of the chaotic, mysterious, powerful depths of our existence. Yeah, the, the sea has power. We love it. We're drawn to it just to watch the waves crash. And, and can, we, can we get mastery over this water? Can we surf it out? Yes. Can we surf on our emotions? Can we surf on our feelings? Can we surf on the narratives that are running, moving like waves through us all the time? When we, when we grieve, it's a kind of surf, is it not? How many of you had this experience in grief, that it comes in waves, yes? You're nodding. Your heads are waving. Yes, grief is like waves. You know, it's nothing, you feel nothing for a while, and then all of a sudden, for no reason at all, you have no idea why, you start to cry. It comes back, it hits you. Or, or you get angry all of a sudden, and you don't even know why. It's a, these are waves. It's the sea of the unconscious. It's the, the grief, which is love, really, manifesting in all these different emotional forms. Do we have awareness of this process of grief? Are we watching it? Are we honoring it, letting it, letting it be? Are we surfing it out, right? Surfing our grief as it goes through this process until the waves begin to get less violent, less extreme over time. They're always there, but it does mellow out. Are we in touch? Are we watching? Uh, are we able to walk on the water of our unconscious dimension? Are we able to see into the sea of ourselves so that we can pay attention and, and notice that there's anger bubbling up in there before it comes <laughs> blasting out in words and actions that we wished we had not done. Yes? The Christ is that consciousness, that capacity that we have, that possibility of mastery of that dimension, of awareness. If we can see what's going on under the water, if we can count the fish, identify the fish swimming around down there, then there's hope that we can respond to our emotions and our urges in more creative and life-sustaining ways. Yes? Yes. So, Jesus offers us swim classes. Yes? Walk in, walk on. Walk in, swim out. Yes? Walk in, swim out. That's what the church is. The church is a fitness center. You are sitting in a fitness center right now, a fitness center for love. Now, you think about this, it's, uh, you know, love is a bunch of work, right? A lot, right? You know, we, we love our families, but that can be a lot of work. That can be heavy lifting at times, yes? <laughs> so we come to church, and then we're surrounded by other people who are doing the same heavy lifting. Sometimes it's tough to love the other people in the church. Oh, we won't talk about that right now, will we? No. <laughs> I would just say this. If you don't know some people in the church here that are heavy lifting in order to love them, then you really, you're in, a, you're in the wrong fitness center. You need to be in a fitness center where you get challenged a bit more, right? So, you know, if, if, if there's nobody in the church that makes it tough for you to love them, then this is not, this is, you need to go find some place where there are tougher people to love so you can build up the muscles, you know? That's what we're here for. We're here to learn how to get good at swimming, right? In the fitness center, there's a swimming pool, you know? No, 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 uh, su no joke, no surprise then that, that uh, the Christian path starts with baptism, right? Getting back in the water getting back in the water, getting in touch with the waters from which we come and in which we live all the time. Are we conscious of what's in the water? Are we able to pay attention to what's in there? Are we able to have mastery 
in it and over it. That's the challenge before us. So, welcome to the swim club. Welcome to the beach. Whatever we lose, like a you or a me, it's always ourselves, our true selves, the Christ self within us, not our egos, not our bodies, not our narratives about ourselves, not our roles in the world. We're, all, we're going to lose all that, right? We're here to pay attention to what, we're, what, what we'll find in the sea, which is our true self, the Christ self, the, the higher consciousness, the deeper awareness. So let us uh, uh, do what the Christ invited us to do and master the waves under them and over them. Amen.